Hey guys, welcome to Spirit Pig. This is the show that explores how to live a fulfilled life. I'm Duncan CJ and today I'm talking with Whitney Johnson. Whitney is an investor, a speaker, author and leading thinker on driving innovation through personal disruption. She's the author of two books, Dare, Dream, Do, Remarkable Things Happen When You Dare to Dream and Disrupt Yourself, Putting the Power of Disruptive Innovation to Work. She's delivered keynote speeches on her ideas and vision to audiences of more than 25,000 and her work has received widespread recognition on sources such as CNN, uh, the BBC, Fast Company, The Guardian, Harvard Business Review and the Wall Street Journal amongst many others. And she was named one of Fortune's 55 most influential women on Twitter and it's her mission to help people to disrupt themselves and to build a remarkable and surprising future. Hello, Whitney. Thank you so much for talking oh, no. to me today. I'm delighted to be here. Famous on Twitter, top 55. Well, that's some, some accolade. <laughs> I think it's funny it's 55, right? <laughs> <laughs> such, such an odd number, but it does stick in your brain, doesn't it? It does. I mean, were they going for the top 50 and then they couldn't decide and then had to add some or... Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I mean, having curated a list or two myself, I completely understand. You just sort of get your group and you realize... It really should be 55 or 45 or whatever. And you sometimes, I think they just decided to take that liberty, which I think was an excellent idea. I like it. It's fantastic. <laughs> Taking things back a bit. I mean, I know you've, um, you've mentioned this on a few other interviews, but just we'll, we'll really quickly jump in there. Like you were, you're working on Wall Street. You're a senior analyst for Latin America at Merrill Lynch. You were one of the top mm -hmm. ranked people in the whole of your field, but you decided to walk away from a seven figure salary, like just I did you know what what was the motivation behind that decision <laughs> it's a great question um when I first actually made that decision I had a really good friend I, I announced to her you know I'm gonna leave Wall Street and she looked at me and she said very calmly are you sure you know what you're doing but I am confident that she was thinking have you lost your mind um, because as you said, I really was at the top of my game. And what was, I think, even more curious to her is that I had started from this place of being very, very junior. I had arrived in New York um, as a music major. I had decided that I wanted to work on Wall Street. I started as a secretary because I had no connections. I had no confidence. And so I'd eventually been able to move up from secretary to investment banker to equity analyst. And now here I was on Wall Street working at Merrill Lynch, going to Mexico, having Carlos Slim, one of the world's richest men, referring to me as La Whitney. When I would upgrade or downgrade a stock, it would move several percentage points. So really, it is a very good question. Had I really lost my mind? Well, if you think about the theory behind why I might have made such a move, um, you look at this idea of whenever you buy a product or service, we think we're buying it, but we're actually hiring it to do a job. And when we hire something to do a job, we're asking it to do a functional and emotional job. So if I buy a house, the functional job is shelter. Um, the emotional job might be a place I can call my own or a really big house. Well, if you look at why I left Merrill from this perspective, it's true. I could have continued to hire Merrill to do the functional job of putting food on the table but I could no longer rely on it for its emotional rewards because the prior year I had had this banner year, my metrics were 20% higher than all of my peers and they paid me the exact same bonus. And then I said, I want to do something new. And they said, no, 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 we like you right where you are. And so from an emotional perspective, we had gone from Merrill paying me to me paying them. And so whenever you look at why someone has disrupted themselves, we typically think it's going to look like, if you look at the functional reason, it will look crazy, but almost always if you'll peel back the layers, you'll find an emotional reason for which it's, the reason becomes very, very compelling and very clear why they, they chose to disrupt. And it's this idea, I mean, I mentioned it in the book title and you just mentioned there, like this idea of disrupting yourself. And um, yeah. uh, I love, I heard that uh, if it feels scary and lonely, then you're probably on the right track. Exactly. And the reason being is if you, if you take the definition of disruption, it's this idea of um, you go to the low end or you create a new market and, and then you have this product or service or individual that eventually upends an industry. So like you had 
Amazon disrupt Barnes and Noble and Borders. You now have Uber disrupting the taxi service. From an individual perspective, if you go at the low end, like I did as a secretary, or into a new market, it means that there's not going to be anybody else playing there. Like a new market, by definition, there's no one there. Or the low end, by nef- definition, no one wants to be there. And so my my view is is that if it's scary, when there's no one there, that can be scary. When it's lonely, no one's there. That's lonely. <laughs> Disruption is by definition scary and lonely. So if you're feeling those ways, there might be other reasons, but I think they can definitely be signals to you that in fact you are on the right path to disruption. Mm-hmm. And what is what is this phrase, uh, the innovator's dilemma? What does that mean? Oh, well, so it's obviously a phrase coined by Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School, who I have learned, you know, I I had the privilege of working with for almost 10 years. And, And the dilemma is, is that once you get to the top of a curve and you've got a product or service or you personally, everything is working just right. Your dilemma is, well, I want to stay here because it feels really good and I'm on the top of the world. But the fact is, is there's no such thing as standing still. And if you stay there long enough, that plateau can become a precipice for two reasons. Number one, you're going to have younger upstarts, entrants who are chasing right behind you, looking to disrupt you and who might be able to be willing to do it at a cheaper price. But the other piece is that once you master a job, you're not, no longer feeling the feel-good effects of learning, that, that dopamine and that neurotransmitter. So you can get bored. And the boredom can actually lead to your do- own demise because you're not really that interested in your job anymore. And so people are like, you're just dialing it in because you are. And so, so that's what I mean by the innovator's dilemma. Whether you innovate or not, you risk downward mobility. So you might as well risk. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, and because if you risk and you choose the terms on which you risk, you're obviously much better off than if you are you know, overturned. Yeah. And what, what was interesting is this statistic, which was, um, which was, yeah, I was, I, I wasn't expecting it at all. It was quite, um, yeah, surprising. 90% of all businesses, all, 90% of all successful new businesses, the yeah. strategy the founders initially pursued didn't lead to the business's success. So they've, exactly. they've zigged, they've zagged, they've actually, they've set up the, you know, this is our goal. This is our business plan. Actually, all of this kind of goes out the window and you've got to go yeah. adapt on the fly. Exactly. Exactly. So first of all, I have to correct myself. In my very first book, I published the statistic 90%. It's actually 70%. You, you read it correctly. I'm very impressed that you read it so closely. The statistic is actually 70%, it, which is still amazing. Yeah. It comes from Amar Bide. And yeah, exactly. So 70% of all successful new businesses end up with a strategy different from the one they initially pursued. And if you think about, like you, w- one example I think of this that's really fantastic is Groupon. Because Groupon started out as, um, as a platform where people could fundraise for a cause or they would boycott a retailer, which is incredibly <laughs> ironic, right? And then you have Netflix, which is this door-to-door DVD rental service, and now it's this streaming company and Emmy you know, award-winning content uh, company. And so if you also take a look at pretty much anybody's career, you'll find that the really successful people, they have pivoted several times. And so they've been able to sort of move up a curve, jump to a new curve, et cetera. And so for me, that really gives me sort of, it gives me courage, not courage isn't the right word, but it, it gives me hope when I'm changing because it means that it doesn't necessarily mean I failed. It just means I'm pivoting. Yeah, that's an. I got the. I got that exact same thing out of it. It's like you know, when if if things mess up or you've got a sunny like right fold and then start again or do something, then it's not you know it's not failure. You know what? Well, anyway, what is failure? You know that's a, a good thing anyway. But it's it's this adapting. It's this zig and zag, and it's I think it's exactly. you know, it's quite an optimistic thing. Yeah, exactly. And and in fact, one of the things that's interesting is you know when you're looking at entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs that you find interesting or you want to back, the question is, is have you seen them be able to pivot in the past? Because it's almost guaranteed they will have to pivot. So the question is, can they do it? Yeah, absolutely. And it was interesting. Once you left, in terms of just having a complete mix match of different ideas and inspirations, I mean, you left and then you've um, you also completely like, different type you've written a children's book and then you and your husband launched a magazine and you were doing fundraising (laughs) with your church and it was 
This, yeah. is, this is the most eclectic, random mixture of things yeah. ever. But I mean, it, it, kind of, it works. I mean, you've got this different, um, I don't know, different interests and inspirations. And I think that kind of creates a more well-rounded whole. Well, thank you. And I think one of the things, I think one of the takeaways from this for anybody who's at that point where they're looking to disrupt themselves and try something new, you'll find that there is, you know, you move on this S curve that I talk about in my book is that you go to the low end of the curve and at the low end of that curve, you're figuring things out and you're experimenting and you're trying lots of new things. And so as you noted, you know, I had written this children's book and I was looking at developing a television series and all these different things, some of which did not work, yeah. right? They didn't work. Um, but in the process of doing that, it, it allowed me to develop and figure out what I was thinking and to create. And now I have this book that, you know, I'll have for my children, even if I never publish it. And so at that low end of the curve, you're going to do a lot of things, some of which will gain traction, some of which won't, but that's okay because it's part of the process. Yeah, no, I think that's it's fantastic. And um, <laughs> dating our dreams or even speed dating yes. our dreams, what, what, yes. what's this about? <laughs> it's a great phrase, well, speed dating our dreams. Well, I just had to mention it because I wanted to say thank it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I think, you, you know, the probably the best way for me to think about this is that it is is whenever you're growing up, and I don't know, I don't think boys do this as much as girls do, but as girls, you know, we grow up and we're, we'll date, we'll go out on a first date with a guy and we'll be like, am I going to marry him? Like, like literally, and it's just like, that puts so much pressure on you, on him, on everybody. And so, and I think we have the same tendency of like, okay, you know, we want to go swimming once or play tennis once. We're like, well, am I going to be a tennis champion? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, you just don't know. And so one of the things I realized is a few years ago, like I really wanted to sing. So I play the piano, but I don't really sing. And so I really, really, really wanted to date this dream. Um, and, but I didn't quit my job. I didn't apply to music school. I took a few voice lessons, which by the way, was a very good thing because even though I really, really, really wanted to date singing, it did not want to date me, right? There are dreams you're going to want to date. They're not going to want to date you. And it's just not. So if you're willing to sort of say, you know what, there are 10 things that look like I really want to do, but sometimes they're just a fantasy. And if you'll literally spend 15 minutes on it, you'll realize, oh yeah, I didn't really want to do that. <laughs> that just made like, me, when you, right? when you, when you're saying that, that just made me think of um, my dad. Um, and he was, uh, I think he had like, this was about an eight. 10 15 years ago so he he had a um he went for a golf lesson and um he had like yeah i think he had like just a really good golf lesson and like he was just hitting the ball really well and i think the golf teacher was really encouraging him and he came home to my mom and said like you know i'm gonna i'm gonna quit my business i'm gonna like come you know sell the business or whatever and i'm, I'm gonna become a professional golf player and i think my mom's like <laughs> wanting to be really encouraging but like thinking like what on earth like he's okay he's not that good at golf but then he was like just go for a couple more lessons and i think about a week yeah. or two later he was like yeah yeah i think that's i think that, that's not gonna happen <laughs> So there this is cool. Go. Have these ideas, so date those dreams. Yeah, yeah. And some of them, they'll, they'll stick and some won't, and that's, that's okay. Yeah, okay. So don't, you don't have to, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm almost do that as well. When you, you, kind of, you kind of almost have to, you kind of mentally and emotionally kind of invest too much in an idea rather than just like, just try it out, just try it out and then just yeah. change. And then, and then you go, kind of, I think that's quite why it's almost quite good to do um, sort of these sort of like work experiences and internships. I always quite liked, you know, when you go to those conferences when it's like four days and it's the most overwhelming thing ever because you could get taught about 30 different business concepts in a day and your brain yeah. is about to explode. But it's like having about 20 different internships and it's got like a little baptism of fire of just all, exactly. these, all these crazy concepts. And it's just like, yes, and then suddenly you hear the next speech, like, oh, I don't want to do that. And it kind of gives yeah. you a kind of idea of just what's out there so it's kind of testing the water a little bit exactly and exactly and I think for for um again I don't know if there's a gender piece here but I think you're giving yourself permission to say literally I am going to date this like one date speed date it takes all the pressure off and then you can go you can you know play tennis once and be like oh you know what that was pretty fun I want to try it again and then when you run it done you're done you're done I mean you don't have to commit to playing golf to playing tennis to doing podcasts or you know video interviews you just get to do it once and you did it once you liked it so you kept doing it right yeah absolutely exactly i love that and i, I resume your, your your one of your dreams is 
to help other people dream. Like, and it's just, I love how sort of clear and concise that is. I mean, you can convey that, you know, when your dreams yeah. is just to help other people to dream. How would you right. recommend, uh, I know, other people find that sort of clarity about their dreams? Because, you know, was that, was that a work in progress? Was that, you know, oh, yeah. over like months, you know, just like just fine tuning it, fine tuning it? Or, I mean, was there an exercise or was that just a lot of retrospection? Or how did you get that sort of clarity? Yeah, I, I think I'm a very introspective person. Um, but I would say that uh, it comes with time. I mean, I think if, if, if someone knows exactly what they want to be when they grow up in their 20s, then they're highly unusual highly unusual. I think for, you know, and I think one of the difficulties with all of these 30 under 30 lists is it perpetuates this myth that you just know what you want to be. I think most people, if they're really honest with you, will say, I have no idea what I want to be when I grow up. And so for me, it's really been a process of of, you know, experimentation. And, you know, like, so I did banking, I thought, I want to be a banker when I grow up. And I realized, okay, maybe I don't. And then I thought, okay, equity, and, you know, analysis, I'm going to do that forever. And I realized, no. So there are this learning, and you start to cobble together your various strengths. And then you eventually, I think, figure out a way in which you can contribute. But to be honest, I don't think I really understood that I was good at helping people figure out what their dreams are and to help make those dreams happen until my mid forties. Like it, and it was, in fact, I was thinking the other day, I think that people would tell me that I was good at it, but because it was so reflexive for me and so natural, I just ignored them. I dismissed the compliment. And so I think one of the things that you can do if you want to figure out what you're good at and therefore what your dreams might be is listen more carefully to the compliments that you are most inclined to dismiss. That's really interesting. And you probably, yeah, you probably don't give them its natural credit because it's so second nature. Like you were like playing the piano or this or that because you're, you're, it's just so, such a part of you. I guess you right. don't really have this perspective to actually see, hey, that's actually seriously impressive. Exactly. It's like, it's like someone looking at you and going, you have a body. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and it's so, so again, yeah. And I think that that's really important because we don't, we don't notice that. And if you'll start listening to those compliments that you're inclined to just dismiss or you're actually tired of, cause you've heard it so many times, that's probably a clue to one of your superpowers and will give you some idea of what your dream is or how to actually get your dream done. Mm. And I quite like the actual about actually acting on your dreams, you know, can you share the story about going for the, uh, the Oprah talk show? Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So this idea of, you know, wanting to encourage people to dream and, and, you know, like you, I love talking to people and like hearing their stories, et cetera. And so I thought, wow, like how awesome would that be if, you know, Oprah put out a call for, she was going to, a call for talk show hosts on her network, OWN, a few years ago. So I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go for this. And I, then I thought, no, no, I'm really scared. And then one of my friends says to me, okay, you're daring people to dream and you're not, maybe you better go do it. So, okay. She did it. So, or she, she called me on it. So I said, okay, I'm going to go. So I did everything I thought that I needed to do for this audition. You know, I, I go from Boston down to New Jersey. I, put together this dossier. I spend a lot of time figuring out what I'm going to wear. I get up at three o'clock in the morning so that I'm there at four for this cattle call in the Coles parking lot. I get there. I've got, you know, five minutes, 30 seconds to make my pitch to them. Like this is the talk show that I want to do. And you know what? I had no idea what I was going to say. Like I'd done all this stuff. And then right in that moment, I had forgotten the most important thing, which is what am I going to say and how am I going to pitch my show? And so that was a really important, important lesson for me on the importance of actually showing up to our dreams. Like once we figure out what our dreams are, or even have this sense of what we think our dream might be, are we actually showing up to the dream or are we somehow sabotaging that so that we can say, oh, well, I didn't get it. And we didn't get it because we didn't try, not understanding that if we give our all and we don't get it, we'll actually be pretty happy because we've given our all. And so that was a really important lesson to me is to not only like figure out what your dreams are, but like really dare to do them and show up to their dreams. Because if you show up to your dreams, your dreams in some form or fashion will show up to you. Yeah. And it's, I love that because it's just the, 
it's, it's that no regrets thing because it's, uh, it's like, you know, whether you get it or don't get it, you know, it's almost, yeah, it's missing the point. It's just you're showing up consistently again and again and, you know, just living life without any regrets or what ifs, you know, I think that's the important bit. Well, and so to, you know, eat my cook, my own cooking, you know, I've got a book coming out in, in, a, in six weeks and, and I said to my publisher, I'm like, you know, I would love for this book to be a New York Times bestseller. And so my publisher looked at me and said, you know, like, the odds of this happening are minuscule. Like they're pouring ice on me figuratively. Like this is not going to happen. And I said, okay, I hear you loud and clear, but I am going to do everything I can to make it happen because I know that in the process of trying to make this happen, I've shown up to my dreams and a lot of wonderful things will happen in trying to make it happen. So I have nothing to lose. And they're like, okay, I get it. But it's hard. It's hard to admit that you want something. That is hard to do. Yeah, yeah. And wh wh who is, for anyone who hasn't heard of her, Eunice uh, Shriver? Because mm. that's, I think that was, that was a pretty, pretty powerful story. Yeah, Eunice Shriver, exactly. You think, you think you should know who she is, and none of us do. So she is the sister, or was the sister of John F. Kennedy, and Bobby Kennedy and Teddy Kennedy. And she, um, as she was growing up, her dad actually said that she was perhaps even more talented politically than they were, but she was a girl. So nothing was going to happen. So she had that happening in her life. She, she happened to be born a girl. So it didn't matter that she was politically very talented. At the same time, she had a younger sister named Rosemary who, um, who was mentally retarded. And at that time they did, they did a lobotomy, which basically sort of took her brain away from her. And so she was so driven by her sister's mental retardation and wanting to do something. She decided to start the special Olympics. And so what's interesting to me is that the special Olympics now, um, because of her political talent, but then because of her why that she had around her sister, she started the, these games back in the sixties that now have literally gone to dozens of countries, if not scores of countries, literally, I would say blessed, blessed the lives of millions of, ch of kids. And she really changed the face and the view of the world of how we see mental retardation and, and disabilities, generally speaking. And for me, I think, and by the way, she's Maria Shriver's mother too, in case you hadn't figured that out. I think about her and, you know, in some ways she's had, you know, far more influence than most if, you know, almost every politician there is. And so she, to me, is a great example of, of actually working within her constraints too, right? She had these major constraints and yet she still figured out a way to do something really powerful and meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it just, that, when I read that story, it kind of tied in all these kind of ideas of like, one, just somebody who is just disrupting themselves, disrupting the status quo. Mm -hmm. But then also, um, when I read this, um, the quote um, which you posted on, um, on Twitter, it kind of tied it all in together with um, Socrates, when he was like, the, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy on creating the new, not fighting the old. And I just yeah. loved it. I just thought it really highlighted those kind of like those ideas, like amazingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that is a great quote. I love that. And especially because I'm trying to not eat any sugar for 15 days. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, well, I'm in the second day. So far, so <laughs> Two good. days in, come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now, come to speed round questions. What does a fulfilled life mean to you? Mm. Uh, I love that question. I, I would say... Um, one of my favorite quotes is from Samuel Johnson, which is the, I'm paraphrasing, the ultimate result of all ambition is to be happy at home. And so for me, a fulfilled life is when I feel happy in my relationships with my husband and my children and um, feel like those relationships are really intact and meaningful and the bonds are strong, even though we may not always agree with each other. Um, I think the other, on a more personal level, because you can't always have control over your family relationships, I would say um, the ability to move from stuck to unstuck. I think one of the reasons that disruption is so powerful to me is that I, there are a lot of things that would make me sad in my life and would be devastating on a lot of levels. But I think if I ever lost the ability to move, to, to move from stuck to unstuck, to stop moving forward 
that would be devastating. And so for me, a fulfilled life is the ability to always just keep moving forward and to be a better person, to have a better character today than I did a year ago. That to me, if I die that way and I'm better at 80 than I was at 79, then I've lived a fulfilled life. That's a great answer. I haven't heard it described like that before. I like it. Uh, What is one thing our listeners can do today that will have a massive positive effect on their lives? Mm. Be grateful. Be grateful. So to think of, um, think of three things. No, 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 not, not even that. Just as you go throughout your life today, you know, as you're driving around, be grateful that you have a car to drive in or be grateful that you're, you've got these amazing cities and subways to, to be in, to be grateful for the beautiful sunshine or the beautiful rain or the beautiful snow. Just find ways to be grateful for all that is around you. And which books has had, which book or books have had the biggest impact on your life? Recently, um, I would say, uh, the innovator's dilemma, obviously by Clayton Christensen. I think, um, uh, Uh, Brene Brown's Daring Greatly had a great um, impact on me in terms of thinking about vulnerability and shame. And the other book that had a really big impact on me was Susan Cain's Quiet, which is about introverts. Not so much because I'm an introvert, but because both my husband and daughter, um, my 14-year-old daughter, are introverts. And so that was really helpful to me to understand them better and how to interact with them, etc. So those are all three books that I did. Uh, and one more book I definitely recommend is a book called We by Robert Johnson. He's a union psychologist, and that really helps us understand our psychological development, which I refer to that book in Dare Dream Do, but that's been a really pivotal book for me as well. Fantastic. Great choices. And last but not least, how can people stay in touch, find out more about you, your work, your books? Where can we send them? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, well, I've got WhitneyJohnson.com is my website. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Johnson Whitney. Um, and if you want to know more about the book that's coming out on October 6th, uh, you can go to disruptyourselfbook.com. And those, um, and then obviously email me, Whitney at WhitneyJohnson.com. So between those four avenues, um, I easily found. Whitney, it was so much fun talking to you. I really appreciate you taking the time. What time, what time is it? You're, 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 I always get my, like, because we, we, we're around the world, our world clock. You're I'm at 10 a.m., are you? I'm at 10.34 a.m. 10.34 a.m., okay. So not, yes. not too, we didn't disrupt your sleep too much. No, you did not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Whitney. I really appreciate it. Thank this you again great for having me. Today. Take care. See you soon. Bye.